to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Since talking about the follistatin collection of proteins a couple weeks back, I've been asked quite a few times to cover SARMs, but in particular YK11, which is the topic of today's discussion, obviously. And although we will hash some of the details of the relationship between follistatin and myostatin today, I do recommend you check out the full video on follistatins, but why wouldn't I? And as another recap, a SARM is a selective androgen receptor modulator, and although there's selectivity for the androgen receptor, a notable goal for these compounds is to target specific tissue types, which refers to the selectivity as well. For instance, targeting the androgen receptors in muscle and bone would in theory have quite different effects than binding the androgen receptors of the prostate. And mechanistically speaking, YK11 is a bit different than your typical SARM, and I would argue it's less SARMish than the others. I can't say there's much research on this one, especially since Anobasarm is the most researched SARM and certainly has its limitations, but let's get into what we can get our hands on. Now, YK11 is formally known as 1721-methoxyethylidine bisoxy-3-oxo-19-norpregna-420-diene-21-carboxylic acid-methyl ester but for simplicity's sake, we're going to stick with YK11. But as exceptions to the rule exist, YK11 isn't really a SARM, and instead it's more of a steroid given its structure and broader androgenic activity, as the research comparing it to DHT in a way suggests. YK11 is unique because it's known as a partial agonist of the androgen receptor, and as such it's known as a steroidal SARM given its four-ring structure. I do feel, however, that a more proper consideration, as it looks very similar to DHT but it's not quite a derivative, is that it's more of a steroid than a SARM as we hinted at, which really compounds our lack of understanding and possibly even the risk, which we'll get into later as well. And just to clarify, although YK11 looks like DHT, it appears to be neither derived from DHT nor particularly intended to strictly replicate its function. We can actually look at the description by the researchers that came out of Japan who prepared it initially in an article published in 2010. And although Although DHT was obtained from a compounding pharmacy as part of this particular study, it was used as a comparative marker for androgen receptor activity, rather than to guide the synthesis of YK11. So this is just a nitty gritty distinction to make for those interested in the compound synthesis and to highlight that we really can't predict its precise mechanism in humans at this point. And it's worth emphasizing that rather than derivation from DHT, which is a popular misconception, it's more closely related to ethosterone, which is more affiliated with activity at the progesterone own receptor. We're going back to partial agonism now. So this is a principle of pharmacology that describes a compound's ability to bind a receptor, but to not have the same efficacy or level of activity as a full agonist. And the leading idea about how it acts as a partial agonist is by activating the androgen receptor without mediating certain chemical interactions, which for the sake of this video really doesn't need further dissection. YK11 is of predominant interest due to its mechanism of action in which it's proposed to be inhibitory of myostatin, which is a protein that negatively regulates muscle mass. As we highlighted in the follistatin video, myostatin assists in regulation of muscle mass and limits the number of muscle fibers present. It's expressed in developing an adult skeletal muscle, and we've talked about double-muscled cattle before in the follistatin video. There are popular photos of these cows that have genetic mutations inactivating the myostatin gene, making them absolutely units due to the dysregulated production of muscle. They're quite literally double-muscled cattle. The idea is that by inhibiting a factor intertwined with regulating production of muscle fibers, we can cause disinhibited growth, which is quite an adventurous idea to me. And since the video on follistatin is quite relevant for this discussion too, I'll make sure to pin it as a recommended video at the end of this one, so you can just click on it. And on top of that, if you haven't already, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. I know we've segued from peptides into a mini series on SARMs, but at our core, this is a peptide focused channel and your support is very much appreciated. So thank you. Okay, so the action of follistatin is through preventing myostatin and another protein called activin from binding to what are called type 2 activin receptors. So in a nutshell, activation of this pathway, i.e. enabling the action of myostatin, stimulates protein degradation and features of muscle wasting. Therefore, 
Blocking this pathway would lead to the reverse, which is muscle hypertrophy. And the idea here is that YK11 inhibits myostatin via increasing expression of folistatin, which would act as a liaison to propagated muscle growth. And despite the aesthetic implications of such an action, when we think about agents like folistatin and YK11, the proposed clinical utility is understandably in conditions that promote degradation of muscle. Things like muscular dystrophies, cancers, or other chronic illnesses like HIV. IV, for instance, and like some of the other compounds we've discussed, like folosatin proteins and the SARMs that have made their way into this mini-series so far, there's literally no human clinical data on YK11, which of course to me is concerning as the long-term safety, not to mention the most short-term of concerns, whether expected adverse effects, hormonal balances, and even pharmacokinetic profile are all up in the air. So I'll post a funny exchange I saw on Reddit highlighting this point. And although there isn't any human studies, there are a few sacks of preclinical data which we'll talk about. And so let's address the studies and what the findings highlight. There are two studies that essentially go hand in hand. The first of which is that the compound was found to upregulate osteoblastic proliferation and differentiation in MC3T3E1 cells. So osteoblasts are cells that help form bone structure. MC3T3E1 is a mouse osteoblast cell line. And when YK11 was administered, these cell lines showed markers indicative of proliferation and differentiation, as well as even maturation, in a manner similar to DHT when compared. The same researchers had earlier discovered similar findings in a mouse myoblast cell line and noticed increased myogenic regulatory factors greater than that of DHT. And an interesting finding on the cell line was that folistatin mRNA was enhanced by YK11, which corroborates and helps influence the idea that it acts as a myostatin inhibitor via increased expression of folistatin itself. And finally, the last pertinent study involves looking at sepsis in rodents. Sepsis, we've all likely heard of it. It's essentially a dysregulated immune response to infection with high rate of mortality and adverse outcomes, one of which is muscle loss. And as this is a state of significant medical illness, it oftentimes comes with a prolonged course of hospitalization and treatment as well. And in this study, in the mice that were made into these septic animal models, it was shown that they had retained muscle mass and decreased fat mass via improved protein metabolism and myosatellite cell function that came with administration of YK11. So this is the core of the research that has driven YK11 as a popular quote-unquote SARM with little to no investigation into its role as a steroid, which it likely predominantly acts as, which not only would evaluate utility, but looking into this also would give input into how it affects gonadal hormones and subsequently its role in fertility versus infertility and more steroid-related adverse effects, whether it be estrogenic outcomes like acne or even prostate health. Compounds that directly interfere with our endocrinology are of course not without risk, and I feel that the paucity of research at this point isn't really even enough to address that, not to mention the basic pharmacokinetic data as well, nor is there anything looking into the effects in humans, which is important because the vast majority of my viewers are reportedly humans, or so they say. And I know I get heat sometimes for ignoring anecdote as research, which don't get me wrong, is legitimate, but making generalized conclusions based off a literal few non-replicated mouse studies isn't quite my MO clearly. That said, I'm intrigued and thankful that the multiple of you who suggested I look into it did so because without our conversations on Volistatin segueing to YK11, I likely wouldn't have even made a mini-series on SARMs. Now, despite all the above, this compound is also notably not without risks. Some research in rodents has shown it to increase oxidative stress, making it an oxidant rather than an antioxidant, induce an extent of mitochondrial dysfunction, and cause neurochemical impairment in the rat hippocampus in high doses. And the implications of this are that on top of all the unknowns, it may even be neurotoxic, impacting not only energy metabolism, but also the way we behave and think. Just food for thought. And why I wouldn't recommend this one, I imagine there's a reason why preclinical research has been all but abandoned. But is it just me? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As we've made a habit by now, all the resources will be linked in the description too, as well as my Patreon if you're looking for a way to further support the channel. All the videos there are member requested and it's a fun, tiny, but growing community. That said, thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence
based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.